folks. Sorry to disappoint you. Doug Gray is off this week, but this is Bryce Payne, financial advisor with the Wealth Guardians. How are y'all? You know, we've received a lot of great questions lately from our listeners, including one from a lady who wants to know how to maximize their Social Security benefits while minimizing their taxes. Find out the answer to that question and many more right now. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and welcome to another edition of the Wealth Guardian Show, where we tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. But before we get started, I want to take an extra few seconds in honor of the pre-July 4th weekend now to give a special salute to all the men and women of the U.S. Armed Forces. You know, both my family and Doug Ray's family have deep military ties. Doug served in the Navy himself, as did his son and father, and his father-in-law and two uncles also served. And his uncle Virgil, he gave the ultimate sacrifice. On my side, my son served in the Army, and my mother, uncle, and stepfather all wore the Air Force uniform. And my father, William Payne, gave the ultimate sacrifice in the Air Force. So thank you to them and to all of our listeners and their families who have volunteered for our freedom. Okay, JB, you're here in the studio with me. How are you doing? Doing great, Bryce. Uh, glad to have you in the studio. Well, thanks. What's uh, what's going on with you for the July 4th week? Well, we're just going to uh, kind of hang out, lay low, and then we're going to go on a little family adventure uh, coming up the week of the 4th. So uh, we're really excited about it. So we're going to take a little time off, which is uh, you know a rare commodity in this business. But uh, we'll be back with you next week. But uh, looking forward to that. Great, great. Well, my wife is headed out of town, so I think I'm going to try to get in as much disc golf over the week. Uh, <laughs> week as I can. Uh, folks, for those of you who don't know, my name is Bryce Payne, and I am a financial advisor with Ray Financial Group and the Wealth Guardians Radio Show. Ray Financial Group is a professional, independent retirement and estate planning firm working with pre-retirees and retirees in all areas of retirement and estate planning, including the areas of wealth management and preservation, asset protection, tax reduction, wealth transfer and distribution, as well as income planning. We are fiduciaries with a fiduciary duty. We have offices in both the Triad and Charlotte, and we can be reached at 336-391-3409 or via the website at www.thewealthguardians.com. So the objective of this show is to educate and inform our listeners of up-to-date, relevant, and important information in the pre-retirement, retirement, retirement, and estate planning arena. So again, welcome to the show today. JB and I look forward to spending the next 30 minutes with you and giving you some solid financial information that hopefully will help you and make a difference in your retirement and estate planning. Well, hello, everybody. Once again, as Bryce said, welcome to the show today. We've got a great show lined up for you. You have asked the questions. Now it's time for some answers. And once a month we do this, we get to answer some great questions from our readers, uh, from the uh, media columns and articles of the listeners and the radio show. So we've got some very good questions to answer. So why don't we just jump right into it, Bryce? Let's turn our attention to a topic that could help many people in retirement. And our first question is from Joyce. Joyce writes in, I'm in the process of looking for a retirement planning professional. Okay. Why should my retirement professional be a fiduciary? Fiduciary. Okay. I love this question, Joyce. It's probably the bedrock to every other question one could ask in the field of finances. There's been a lot of talk lately about fiduciary duty and why it is so important. You want to work with an advisor who has to, by law, act in your best interests. Basically, there are two standards in the financial arena. The first one is called the suitability standard, which simply says that a financial advisor must only recommend something that, quote unquote, suits you. It doesn't necessarily have to be in your best interest. It can be in their best interest. So their advice just has to suit you based on your goals and objectives. That's what's called the suitability standard. And that is the way most financial advisors operate. And they adhere to that duty. The other duty is called the fiduciary duty. Only advisors that hold specific and certain licenses have to adhere to this fiduciary duty standard. Doug holds it through his chartered financial certification, and I hold it through my FINRA Series 66 license. Again, this means by law, we or they are required on all recommendations to act in your best interest. So it can't be to the financial advisor's best interest. It has to be to the consumer's best interest. That's why we think it's so important to try to work with a fiduciary in today's day and age. So hopefully that clarifies the difference for you as you consider who can be helping you with your financial plans moving forward here. 
that's a great, great, great answer because a lot of folks didn't know what a fiduciary was. To be honest, no, it's you. it's a term that's thrown out there a lot, and to a lot of people, it doesn't have a meaning. Right. Well, that's a great so answer. There's your meaning, folks. All right. Thank you very much for writing in too. All right, Bryce. We've got another question. It comes in from Michael, and Michael writes in. I retired last year after working practically my entire life. I thought I was ready to rest and relax. Well, I realize now that (laughs) working was a large part of who I am. We Uh understand. I'm extremely bored, and I regret my decision. But I would like to find something else to do with my time. Can I take a part-time job without affecting my benefits? I wasn't meant for a life of sitting on the couch and watching TV. Please help. Sincerely, Michael. I okay. think a lot of folks fall into this. Category. Oh, yeah, absolutely. My stepfather did. Uh, he retired and then realized within a year that uh, he couldn't fish all day, every day. <laughs> right. So he, he's uh, he's back doing work again and loves it. Well, Michael, I certainly appreciate your question. Congratulations for uh, getting to retirement. Um, it, it's a common theme, to be honest with you. I think what you mean by it affecting your benefits is your Social Security benefits. So depending on your age, if you've already turned Social Security on, you are allowed either to make as much as you want without it affecting your Social Security benefits, or you're allowed to make up to a certain point before you have to start paying some of your Social Security benefits back. Now, if you're past full, what's called full retirement age, which depending on when you were born is between age 65 and 67, that's a Social Security term, folks, Mm -hmm. then you can make as much as you want without it affecting any of your benefits. But if you are under your full retirement age and you've already turned Social Security on, you may be limited in how much you can make before you start paying that back. So I think in this case, what you're asking um, is very relevant, but um, feel free to contact us because I need to know a little bit more information on, uh, on giving you some clear answers on that. Well, that's some good, some great information to know, actually, there, Bryce. All right, Bryce, our next question comes in from a couple now uh, who are looking to get married, but... They want to make sure that all their individual assets will be protected. And here's the question. It says, I am a 78-year-old widower with three grown children. Um, I recently met Helen, a widow, with some grown children of her own. Now, things have turned serious, and we are discussing marriage. Wow. All right. That's great. Our children are concerned about what would happen to our estates if we married and something happened to one of us. How can we reassure them that our states will be protected and remain in our respective families after our passing? Looking forward to your response so we can move forward with our plans. Sincerely, (laughs) William and Helen. First off, congratulations. Yeah, no, absolutely. Congratulations, William and Helen. Again, another common question that we get a lot. The good news is that there are answers here and there are always ways to do this. So as you can imagine... There's a lot of remarriages or second marriages with children from a previous marriage. This happens a lot in the elder years. A lot of times when spouses pass away, the ones remaining find other spouses to spend the rest of their lives with. Power to them. Mm -hmm. So it is common. And the good news is the answer here is strictly legal documents. Mm -hmm. So find a good attorney that specializes in estate planning, and they can set up your legal documents the right way to protect children from previous marriages. In fact, there are some different options and things that you may want to consider. Um, Off the top of my head, one example, if something happens to one of you, you may want to give the remaining spouse the right to stay in that existing house until he or she passes away. And then when the second spouse passes, the house can revert back to the children from your original marriage. That happens more than a lot. So there are a lot of different things you you can do, different types of legal documents you can set up to meet the needs of both you and your new spouse, as well as your own individual children to protect their needs and allow the estate to eventually pass on to your children from your original marriage. There's no shortage of attorneys out there that do a very good job at this. If you need names, do please feel free to reach out to us, and we'll be happy to supply some to you. And once again, best wishes going out to William and Helen. I hope that it uh, sounds like you got everything uh, working in your and uh, doing the right things and uh, going to make it happen. 78. Good job. That's great. All right. We uh, we hope that you have many years of happy marriage in front of you there. And we've got another question coming in now, Bryce. Uh, it comes from Alex. Hi, Alex. And uh, Alex says, uh, hello, I am 30 years of age and I have a great job. Uh, The money I made during the first five years of employment was used to pay back student loans and other expenses. Been there, done that. Um, However, now I am debt-free, and I want to start my financial portfolio. Outstanding. Now, you mentioned on the radio show that people should not wait to help with their finance. I should say uh, not wait to get help with their finances. My question, where is a good place to put my money, and what tools should I be using to save? 
Now, many financial planners do not work with people, you know, my age, which is, you know, relatively young, once again, at 30 years of age, uh, who are just starting out. But I would like to make some contributions to a Roth account and really start working on my financial plan. And it's signed, Alex. All right. Well, Alex, uh, thanks for your question. And you are right. It makes all the sense in the world to start saving for your retirement just as soon as you possibly can. That can make a tremendous difference in the ultimate value of your retirement plan down the road. So if you are in a situation now where you're debt-free, uh, congratulations. No other way to say it. Right. And if you want to start putting money towards your retirement plan, uh, I'm not going to tell you that that's a bad idea. That's actually a great idea. Um, I would start with your employer's retirement savings plan. Uh, it's generally called a 401k, maybe a 403b, depending on what your line of work is. If they have a match, because that's going to allow you to put the most back towards retirement. If they do have a match, then it's free money to you. So why not take advantage of this? You want to make sure at least contribute to that full match. Just understand that any money you do contribute to that plan is going to be tied up to age 59 and a half. So make sure it's retirement assets that you're putting away. You also, depending on how much income you have, may be able to contribute to your own personal retirement savings plan. Now, you mentioned a Roth IRA, and the good news about a Roth IRA is that the contributions you make to a Roth account are not tied up to age 59 and a half. So this is contrary to popular belief, so I'm going to repeat it. The amount you contribute to a Roth is not tied up to age 59 and a half. So if you need to get to that money, you can. Only the interest portion is tied up to age 59 and a half. Only the interest, folks. So you can certainly start with those two options, and then there are a lot of other options in addition to that. Depending on how much you want to put back, we may be able to give you additional advice. Now, I know that you touched, Alex, on um, what to invest in. I'm not going to give you that advice over the phone. Uh, that would have to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Doug Ray, you and myself, as with any of our listeners, just to make sure that we're understanding exactly what uh, what your needs and risk tolerance is. All right, Bryce, great answer. And folks, uh, we're going to take a quick time out. We want to remind you, you are listening to the Wealth Guardians radio show right here on 94.5 WPTI. We appreciate you being with us. You can reach Doug or Bryce at 336-391-3409 or remember the website, thewealthguardians.com. Stay tuned. we got a few more questions to get to, and we'll be right back. I didn't notice what time it was. And welcome back to the Wealth Guardians radio show, right in the middle of our questions and answer show for June. So let's continue. Bryce, our next question comes from Joy. And Joy writes in, I heard your show recently about inherited IRAs, and I have uh, a follow-up question on that. A friend of mine has designated me as a beneficiary of her IRA. Okay. Now, if and when I inherit that money, is it considered to be a community property with my husband? Mm. Also, is it taxable income. Okay. Finally, if it is taxable to me and if I don't use all the money in my lifetime, how do I prevent it from being taxable to my beneficiaries? Thank you, Joy. Okay, great. Hi, Joy. Uh, thanks for the question. First, if you do inherit that money and you set up what is called an inherited IRA, then it is not considered to be community property. Fun fact, inheritances are considered separate property in every state, mm. including community property states. A lot of people don't know that. Your next question, is it taxable income? Well, yeah, it is. All IRAs are taxable income. But again, if you set up an inherited IRA, then you don't have to pay taxes on the whole thing at once. Now, if you fail to set it up as an inherited IRA or you decide to just take the money, then it will all be taxable to you in the year you receive it. Depending on the size of this, that could really throw you into a very high tax bracket. So please be careful. But again, if you set it up as an inherited IRA, even though it is taxable, it is not taxable all at once. You're just required to take out a little bit each year and pay taxes on that amount of money. So again, I would highly recommend you do it the way, uh, the inherited IRA way, because that doesn't restrict you in any way. And uh, JB, what was the second part of the question? Uh, Joy wanted to know if she doesn't use all the money in the lifetime in her lifetime, all right. how does it prevent it from being taxable to the beneficiary? Okay, right. Uh, well, regarding that part of your question, Joy, if you don't use all the money in your lifetime, how do you prevent it from being taxable to your beneficiaries? Again, if you name beneficiaries on this account, which you should, and you don't use it all, then it is going to pass to them. They are going to have to pay taxes on the amount of money they receive. And like you, if they established an inherited IRA, then they can stretch it out as well. 
However, if you don't want it to be taxable to them, then what you can do over your lifetime is draw out as much as would make sense each year tax-wise, not more, and you pay the taxes on it, and then put that money in some type of non-taxable account or gift it to the beneficiaries. That way, you can make it non-taxable to them. Okay? Hopefully that answers your questions. And if there are some parts in here that I didn't get to, please let us know, and we'd be more than happy to answer in a little bit more detail. But... You have the right thought in mind as far as what you want to do, and for that, good job. All right, Bryce, we got another question in. It comes in from Julie, and Julie says, I'm 53 years old. My husband is 64. He's going to be retiring next year. I anticipate working for quite some time after my husband retires. Now, I know that at his age, the investment he makes should be less risky since he would not have the opportunity to earn back the money if his accounts take a large hit. But what about me? Should I be adjusting my investments to reflect his upcoming retirement, Mm. or is it okay for me to continue to take a little more risk, assuming I have several more years to recoup the loss if the markets take a hit? Thanks, Julie. Great question. Okay, Julie. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, Let me first ask you a question on this. Why would you ever want to take a hit, no matter how long you have until retirement? True. You don't ever want to take a big hit because losses count so much more than gains. So think about this math here, folks. If you lose 50% of your portfolio, how much do you have to gain to make it back to even? Mm -hmm. You have to gain 100% back. So you lose 50%, you have to gain back 100% to get back to even. That happened to a lot of people back in 2008 and early 2009, and they spent the next five, seven I don't, even 10 years just getting back to even. Mm-hmm. So five, 10 years of wasted time trying just to recover and not building wealth, no matter what your age, nobody wants to go through that. Now, having said that, I know what you're asking here, which is, should you get more conservative or be a little bit more aggressive at your age? But in today's day and age, with all the tools available based on technology advances, and uh, there's a lot of them, um, you want to make changes and adapt to changing market conditions. Um, there are ways to do that. In other words, what I'm trying to say here is there are managed strategies available today that make changes to your investments to make sure your portfolio is always in a low risk yet bullish position. No matter what the overall market is doing. So in today's world, you do not have to quote unquote be more aggressive in order to achieve more return. So. If you can prevent those big hits and adjust your portfolio the right way, then you can build compounding interest over time and not have to spend a lot of time making up for that lost ground. What you want to do is have a proper risk management system in place from the beginning, and that's designed to keep your portfolio always in a bullish, low-risk position, no matter what the overall market is doing. That way, corrections will be limited to normal corrections, not those 30, 40, or 50% corrections. And those won't hurt you over time nearly as bad. If you can do that, you can really build compounding interest over time by avoiding those huge hits. So I really do appreciate the question. I like your thinking here, but there is no reason for your risk tolerance to be any different than your husband's at this point. Both of your objectives should be to keep your portfolios in a low-risk, stable environment at all times, no matter what the overall markets are doing. Now, if you need help with getting additional information about these types of approaches, please feel free to reach out to us. We have some great white papers we can send you via email on what we call adaptive management in today's day and age, Uh, information on what the differences are between um, traditional asset allocation, uh, the buy and hold approach, the adaptive portfolio models. Those are all available today. So you can really read about the differences and about how big a difference it can possibly make in your retirement savings. So if you'd like information on what we what we have, we'll be happy to email it to you. Just feel free to reach out to us and request it. All right. Okay, Bryce, we've got another question. It's in from Katie. Hi, Katie. Katie wants to know, with the recent tax cuts and probable tax increases in the future, is there any reason to do a traditional tax-deductible IRA over a Roth IRA? Okay, great question, Katie, and great foresight. I liked how you uh, mentioned possible or probable tax increases in the future. You got it. Right. Um, You are thinking correctly here. The answer to this question is yes. There are still certain circumstances that you will want to do the traditional way, the tax-deductible way of saving, instead of the Roth way or what we call the tax-free way. So before I get into the details of this answer, let me remind everyone what the differences are between the two. 
your traditional tax-deductible IRA or your traditional 401k contributions are what we call tax-deductible, which means you are not paying any taxes on that money going in, but you will pay taxes on the money eventually when you take it out. The Roth approach or the tax-free approach is the opposite. That has you pay the taxes now on the money you're putting in, but all the interest that money makes, and when you take the money out down the line, will be completely tax-free. So the tax-deductible approach is not paying tax on the seed, but you will pay tax on the entire harvest when it comes in. And the tax-free approach has you paying tax on the seed now, but the entire harvest will come in tax-free. So the answer to your question is both of these approaches have their time and purpose. Your question is, because of the recent tax cuts, is there as much of a reason to do the tax-deductible approach? Well, again, yes, in some circumstances there are, but in many cases now, it makes more sense to go with the Roth approach. Now, a lot of people are never going to be in any lower tax, uh, tax brackets now than they are today. If you are in the lowest tax bracket you are probably ever going to be in, then it doesn't make sense for you to do a tax-deductible approach anymore because you are putting yourself at risk of being in a higher tax bracket later when you pull the money out. A lot of people now are in that situation because of these new tax laws. Taxes basically are at historic lows, but unfortunately, this new tax law is only temporary. It is set to expire in 2025, at least for us on the individual level. So what we have been kind of preaching on this radio show the last several weeks, you may have noticed, is to look at your situation and analyze it. Really get an idea where you are today tax-wise and where you are probably going to be in retirement tax-wise, so you get, get an idea which is the best way you can save going forward. Now, many people need to change it up and do different things based on this new law. So if you are in a low tax bracket today, then chances are when you retire and Social Security starts coming, maybe a pension gets paid, you start drawing money out of your other retirement accounts, you lose some of those deductions that you're used to, then you could be in that same higher tax bracket. If this is the case, you don't want to be making tax-deductible contributions today and putting yourself in a position of paying more taxes later when you draw it out. So if you think you'll be in a higher tax bracket when you retire, then you may very well want to start saving on an after-tax or tax-free basis where you don't take the tax deduction today, but put it in a tax-free position where you can reap the tax benefits later down the line. Now, having said all that, if you're making a lot of money today and you are in the higher tax brackets and based on retirement projections you feel you could be in a lower tax bracket down the road or in retirement, then it makes sense to make contributions on the tax-deductible basis. So again, when you start drawing money out of retirement, savings accounts to live off of in retirement, the way the IRS code is set up, this could cause your Social Security to be taxed. Not only will you pay tax on your retirement savings account money if you saved on a pre-tax basis, but this also counts in the formula for determining how much of your Social Security is going to be taxed. There are a lot of moving parts to this, and you will want to examine all of them to determine and make sure you're saving the most proper way for retirement. Remember, we've said it many times on the show already, saving money for retirement is very, very important, but how you save is even more important. So great question, Katie. I hope my answer was clear. If you have a follow-up question or need more information, feel free to contact me, uh, myself and Doug at the Wealth Guardians. We'd love to hear from you. Well, unfortunately, folks, um, we're getting close to being out of time here. Not enough time for another question. I apologize that we were not able to get to all of the questions today that were submitted. There are some other great ones out there, but we will get back to them. Um, as always, if you do have a question that you would like my thoughts or Doug's thoughts on that you would like to possibly have on the show, please feel free to send an email to me at Bryce, that's B-R-I-C-E, at thewealthguardians.com or Doug, D-O-U-G, at thewealthguardians.com, or call us at 336-391-3409. Remember, always make sure you obtain the proper help and work with a qualified, competent, educated, and experienced retirement specialist to make sure you are aware of and understand all of your options to make sure your planning is set up the absolute best way for your unique and specific situation. Don't take advice from the guy down the street who's good with a lawnmower. <laughs> you want somebody who's good with financial advice. Um, other than that, folks, I want you all to have a good, fun, safe, 
Fourth of July week. Hopefully you get together with some family, shoot off some of those fireworks, and uh, JB, I hope we don't get rained out. Oh, I I think we're going to have a great forecast, but folks, have a great weekend. Bryce, great job today, and we'll talk to you next week on the Wealth Guardian Show right here on 94.5 WPTI. And Doug should be back next week, folks. All right. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care.